Sup y'all it's me it's yo boy fanfic audiobooks enjoy the story and don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Also comment what you want to see next in the channel, let's start. Chapter 50, R&R in Fura. Kana was surprised to find the guilt to be totally empty when she walked through the doors, save for the scowling blonde woman sitting behind the bar. Launch looked up from a magazine on her lap when she heard the door open and let out a sigh of relief. Finally, someone who I know will actually buy something. Get over here and spend some money, beachfront. Beachfront. Kana asked as she slid onto a stool. Launch just stared pointedly at the brunette's bikini top as she began pulling bottles out from below the counter for her latest attempt at creating a mixed drink capable of toppling the alcoholic. You dress like you're heading to the beach 24-7 and you like to expose your front. That's your nickname now. Don't like it. Tough. The blonde answered, busying herself with dumping the 42 different types of liquor into Kana's favorite giant mug, along with a few different juices and dash of club soda, and slid it over. Thank God your imagination is better when it comes to bartending than with names, or I might actually have to go out to get my fix. Any kid you pop out is going to get strapped with dinner, as a name or something. She said before tipping her head back and downing the entire concoction in one go. Ah, not bad. Tastes, Minty? Yeah, needed something to mask the taste. No matter how drunk it gets you, nobody wants to drink something that tastes like paint stripper. Launch muttered, eyeing Kana carefully. The brunette chuckled and shook her head. That's still not enough to get me in one glass. She said smugly. Looks like I win again. Kana was all smiles as slid off of the stool and took a tiny bow. Why's this place so empty right now? I would have thought I'd have to wait in line for a bit this time of day. The little bossman came in with another stack of jobs about half an hour ago. He said that he couldn't afford everyone slacking off and started throwing them at the crowd like a sleazeball throws singles at strippers. The blonde sighed. Then he promised a free round to whoever finished first, and next thing I know I'm making absolutely no tips today. Launch said as she pointedly stared at the empty jar sitting on her left. Kana just rolled her eyes and glanced towards the door that lead off to the back of the building. All right, now as nice as it's been hanging out with you launch. I promised Lucy that we'd spend the day together. Is she in the back, or do I need to go and drag her out of bed? Hmm, I don't know. Launch's voice suddenly took on a lisp and turned airy. My memory isn't all that good, Kana. I just wish there was some way for me to jog my memory. She continued as she accidentally knocked her tip jar so it slid directly in front of Kana's space. Seriously? Kana deadpanned. If you wanted some more money, you could have just said so. After that little show though, I think I might be too disturbed to even reach for my wallet. Launch's happy front crumbled in an instant. Yeah, well. I based my acting on you. Wait, that's supposed to be me. Kana laughed. When do I do stuff like that? Usually after the twelfth drink, when I don't give you a thirteenth. Kana's jaw clicked shut, unable to be sure if Launch was telling the truth or not. Well, anyway. You're still gonna have to do better than that if you want my 15%. The smiles that the two girls gave one another were pure predator, two alphas circling one another and dealing out lightning fast cuts as they tried to find the killing blow. So, I'd have to do something I'm good at my tip then. If you can impress me, then sure. Got any more tricks besides alcohol and the world's fastest hair change? Kana challenged. Launch smiled as she placed a pistol onto the counter. You a fan of trick shots, beachfront? Sure am, but you are going to have to do some pretty fancy pistol work to top some of the crazy stuff I've seen Alzac do. He sets a high bar. Not a problem, Launch cracked her knuckles. Mr. Poncho is a pansy. He hasn't got the guts to try anything really creative. Come on then. 
Kayla said, as she pulled out five hundred jewels and laid them on the counter. Dazzle me. The pistol was back in Launch's hand in an instant, aimed off towards a screw drilled into one of the rafters. Her other hand was beneath the counter, pulling out a cast iron pot and tossing it up into the air. It had just reached its peak over Kana's head when she squeezed the trigger, firing the bullet out of the gun, off the metal, and then right into the cast iron pot at just the right angle to send the bullet straight down, so close that it nearly crazed Kana before it drilled a hole in the floorboards between her feet. It was nothing special. Kana smirked and leaned back. It wasn't the non-magical girl's fault that her crazy ricochet was something either of the gun duo could do in their sleep. For a regular person, that was probably the single best shot that she had ever seen in her life, just close enough to show the danger, but not enough to actually cause any harm. Then, as she shifted, she felt her bikini top fall open. She blinked, staring down blankly as the cloth fell to the floor. The bullet had sliced almost perfectly through the front clasp without her even having noticed, there had been just enough left to hold it together until she moved. She looked back up at the blonde, who smirked and daintily scooped up the money. Kana opened her mouth to say something when the door to the library flung open and Lucy stormed in, anxiety in her eyes and a key in each hand. She stopped short when her eyes fell on Kana, who had made no move to pick up her top. What? she asked, looking dazed. Oh, hey Lou. Kana grinned sheepishly, moving one arm to block the view while leaning down to grope for her fallen clothing. No need to panic, I think I just lost a bet is all. Damn straight why I did. Launch crowed, gleefully thumbing through the bills. Congrats on your free show, key girl. She added, grinning over her shoulder. Kana managed to fix a decent knot and hurried away, grabbing Lucy and slamming the library door closed behind her. What is it about this place? Kana mused. I'd swear all the clothes are made of tissue paper. If people aren't taking them off, they get destroyed. Lucy said nothing, when Kana glanced at her, she saw the summoner looked dazed. She grinned. Yo, Lou. I know they were gorgeous, but I'm talking to you. Lucy blinked and shook her head, her face flushing slightly. I'm sorry I burst in like that. There wasn't supposed to be anyone in the guilt for a while, so when I heard a gunshot. Kana grinned. You just acted right. Yeah, feels kind of dumb now though. Come on now Lou, no reason to be all hesitant about that. You thought one of our friends was in danger, so you moved. That's exactly what you are supposed to do. Nobody is going to laugh at you or anything. There was no way Kana was going to let Lucy second-guess herself, or let her start worrying about making the right call. She was going to smother the depression with cheerfulness and make Lucy feel so much unconditional love that she would get sick of it. So, what were you doing hanging around the library? Reading some steamy romance as you waited for me to grace your presence. Okay, unconditional love and teasing. She was only human, after all. Levi hide those I mean, no. Luce's eyes darted down at the table to Kana's side and the brunette looked down to see a thick blue book with golden words sparking across the cover. Fifty-seven fairy tales from across the lands. Don't think I've seen this one back here before, not that I've ever really had much of a reason to be in here I guess. Trying for some childhood nostalgia. That's my mother's book. Kana sucked in breath to apologize, but Lucy didn't look upset, so she thought better of it. She used to read me all those stories before bedtime, you know. Took us ages to get through the whole book together, but I loved hearing about all these amazing heroes, and how they would go out to save the day. It made me want to go out and do the same thing. Is that part of the reason you wanted to join this guild? Fairy tales inspired you to be a hero, so you joined fairy tale. Okay, when you say it like that, it sounds corny. The blonde groaned. It wasn't that huge a factor for joining, the guild's reputation was what drew me here. It was just this fun little reminder, 
something that helped me feel closer to my mom after I became a member. I know it's silly, but she's been gone for so long. I just take any kind of connection I can get, you know. Well crap. This was not a fun topic. Ah, yeah. Parents, they can be really rough. I, ah, uh, I don't have a mom anymore either. I actually came here to find my dad at her request, and then I find out that he's this crazy playboy that's been with so many women over the years that he probably has no idea who my mom even is. Maybe that's why I like girls so much better. Kana shrugged. My dad just managed to bankrupt a multimillion jewel company and had to take a loan out from his teenage daughter so he could try and restart his life. It was the single nicest conversation that I can remember having with him since I was six. Okay, this isn't a competition, Lucy. Kana groaned, making the summoner smile. We are just a couple of walking daddy issues, aren't we? Guess that just means that we are perfect for one another, Halu. You're such a dolt. Course I am, that's part of the charm. Kana reached down and opened the book, flipping through pages until she found the beginning of a tale that she hadn't read before. So, do you want me to read to you, or would you like to read some of your favorites too? Me? We could take turns. Perfect. The pair sat side by side for hours, slowly making their way through the book of fantasies. Kana kept one arm draped over Lucy for the entire time, quietly reveling in the gradual release of tension that she felt through her partner's body the longer they sat a day. Consciously or not, Lucy was relaxing into her. The entire time, they didn't talk except to tell stories to one another. The further they got into the book the more they got into the act, changing their voices, making sound effects, and rocking into one another at ever clash of good and evil. I still think you're a hero by the way. The instant she heard the words Luce's eyes snapped up to meet Kana's, book forgotten. I still don't know if I can believe that. She muttered back. Kana just pulled the girl in tight. That's fine. I'll just keep telling you until you do. I'm sure it will sink in sooner or later. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Myra darted off before Urza could answer. The muscles in Lax's neck tensed as she approached, and when she took the seat directly across from him he let out a long sigh. So, we are doing this now then. The thunder mage drawled. Yes, we are. Myra answered. We can go outside and have a completely different kind of conversation. But I thought we might as well at least try and hash this out in a vaguely responsible manner. Let's just get outside before you piss me off, and we cost Gramps another guild hall. The man said, pushing out of his seat and trudging over towards the door. Myra Jane was on his heels in an instant. I suppose that's fair, we've already established pretty well that you've got no impulse control, Mr. Flash me if you want my help. I'm still amazed that we aren't flooded with complaints every single time that you leave town. Decide to keep all the issues in-house. To be honest, I couldn't give a shit either way if you had done it or not, or if you had convinced one of those girls to date me, or anything else along those lines. Myra's pace stuttered for an instant at that. Her face scrunched up in a myriad of emotions before settling on distrust. Then what was the point? Laxus paused for a moment, looking around to decide where he wanted to take the conversation before he gave a mental shrug and headed down towards the beach. It was still a mess of craters from the invasion, a simple tourist trap falling extremely low on priority list of rebuilding. Combined with all of the dark magic still lingering over the area, nobody was likely to be down there. A perfect place to keep any sort of conflict out of the way, which was probably going to be necessary. Humiliation This guild used to be recognized, indisputably, as the strongest guild, capable of taking on the most dangerous missions in this entire country. But after my gramps kicked my dad out of the guild, all of that went to shit. He heard the takeover hiss as she drew in breath to shout at him, he talked over her. Sure, we got some guys with a good bit of grit, but most of our mags are trash. They would be lucky to break an A or AB rating. We've even got a share of C-class mags. When my father was still here, if the stronger mags saw that. Their fellows were too weak, they'd help train them up to be stronger. Today, the drive is gone. Most of our mags are content, coasting along with their current standing and never striving to be greater. I hear people talking, oh fairies are just the craziest people. Fairy tale has literally become a joke. There are more important things than reputation. Myra snapped. Our guild is a family. We support each other. Fairy tale is hardly the only guild that calls itself a family. Laxus snorted. Hell, every one of the guilds that we just allied ourselves with said the same thing, even the fake ghost one. The difference was, we were a guild where every last family member could protect one another, no matter what. Now, we say we will protect each other, then depend on two or three of us to actually do the heavy lifting, while the rest barely get by. So what? People rely on one another all the time. The people without magic all rely on us to protect them from demons and such, what does it matter if we rely on some of our own more than others? The common folk aren't the ones who have to go face demons, or armors of dark mags, or any of the other crazy stuff that's constantly trying to wipe everything out. That's us. We are a ticking time bomb. All it will take is a handful of lucky shots, or some stupid mind control bullshit, and our guild is screwed. The entire guild will become a laughing stock to the rest of the world. It's humiliating just to think about. That we support so many that are too weak to stand on their own. All it's going to take is a single failed mission, and then everything my family did to build this place up will all be for nothing. I disagree with Gramps on a lot of things, but he has worked himself down to the bone because there isn't a single person dependable enough here for him to pass on the legacy. If he goes, then this place will go. My father, I barely remember him from before when Gramps kicked him out, but I remember that he valued strength over everything else. He knew that the strength of our guild was the best way to keep it together. 
So, when Phantom Lord rolled around to try and crush us, you felt humiliated that a newer guild was able to threaten us. And you decided that the best thing to do was to try and force us to feel as horrible as you did. Is that what you were thinking? Laxus deflated a bit. Yeah. I was thinking that either you'd get my help and feel humiliated, or you'd all get smacked around and learn that you need to get stronger. All of you. We can't continue like this. Yes, we can. The guild has been running perfectly fine for years, and despite everything that's been going on, we've only been getting better. We branched out, we specialized. We don't need an entire building full of bruises, we have plenty. Now other people do what they like with their own magic. They don't have to specialize in fighting because they know that that people like us are there to handle that for them. That lets them be magical woodcarvers, or puzzle solvers, or painters, or whatever else. Just because your dad was an ass and you've got issues, it doesn't mean that you've got to bully and abuse everyone up to your level. Yeah? Sorry. What, that's it? Yeah, sorry. You, that's it. Do you even understand why I'm pissed? Believe it or not, I figured it out back when Goku beat my ass, right before that demon beat my ass. He's the guy who pushes himself to get stronger the most around here besides myself dash. Pretty sure he beats you at that too. Besides myself, and he actually follows those family beliefs that everyone else seems to love. And then, he utterly creamed me. If he can get that strong while following that philosophy, I can't really argue against it anymore. It's like you said, I've got issues from my dad and I took them out on you and everyone else here. At this point though, I can't really do anything but say that I'm sorry. If it makes you feel any better though, we won't have to deal with each other much longer. I'm leaving on a training trip after tomorrow, without the Thunder Tribe. I need to go sort some things out, and I've got no clue when I'll be back. Just a few months ago, I probably would have been fine with forgive and forget. But I've just been so angry lately, after everything that's happened around here, gah. You're a real jerk, but you're still family. Like that drunk uncle everyone tolerates. Laxus frowned but said nothing. Okay. Myra Jane muttered. Let's do this like everyone else in the guild always seems to do. We are going to beat the snot out of each other, and then when things are done, the winner is going to drag the loser to the medic and we are going to agree to at least get along enough to cooperate, forgiveness not included. I think it would break tradition if we didn't solve this with violence anyways. Laxus noted before he covered himself in a wreath of electricity. Let's get this over with. Then. Let's. Satan's soul. Myra announced her transformation. The two regarded each other for a moment, taking in the other's power. Then they struck. A pair of right hooks crashed together between them, blasting a wave of sand into the air as the darkness tried to consume the lightning. Laxa started to slip backwards, leaving scuffs in the sand as he strained against Myra's demonic strength. Right as his blow started to peter out, the lacrima in his chest kicked in at full force. A lightning bolt cleaved through the sky and struck the struggling pair, blasting Myra Jane backwards across the beach. With a quick flap of her wings she righted herself in midair and spun around, blasting back towards the lightning mage like a kamikaze fighter. Laxus ignored her charge, as he pushed his electricity throughout his body, swelling his muscles and hardening his flesh. Determination flared in his mind, as he reared back to unleash a lightning dragon's roar, and was promptly punched in the face. Make sure to work on that charge up time while you're gone, Laxus. Myra Jane shouted as she pressed her advantage, darting in with a trio of punches across Laxus' ribcage. Laxus groaned alongside the crack that came from his chest. Barely ten seconds into the fight, and he was already on the defensive. No taunting, no playing around, this time he needed to go full out right from the word go. So, he moved. Mirajni's fourth punch whiffed through the open air as her target vanished in a yellow flash. 
A sound had her spinning around with her hand cocked back, but before she could do anything a sparking hand wrapped around her mouth. Myra twitched wildly as lightning poured through her body as Laxus lifted her up into the air and slammed her back head first into the ground. Myra Jane flailed around to try and get back up onto her feet, and her opponent allowed her to. The moment she was back up Laxus slammed into her like a battering ram and wrapped around her like an electric eel, one hand around her throat while the other twisted her arm backwards to keep her from getting leverage to free herself. Myra bit down the scream as the lightning burned through her nervous system and tried to focus her magic. Evil explosion. Point blank, not even the electric armor Laxus wore was enough to shrug off the blast. Laxus went bouncing across the sand, his shirt nearly obliterated off of his body, and his entire chest now an aching bruise. Myra Jane coughed violently staggered upright, her neck now an angry red all around. Going straight asterisk cough asterisk straight to the cheap tricks Laxus. The girl complained as she rubbed her sore throat. It's a fight, he grunted. There are no cheap tricks. If you aren't good enough to stop me, that's not my problem. If it really bothers you, throw some sand in my eyes or something. Lightning dragons roar. As fast as a Satan soul was, it was not capable of dodging a supersized lightning bolt. Myra Jane had just enough time to throw her arms up in front of her before the blast struck home. Or rather, just enough time to throw up her arms and call forth an even deeper well of magic. Lax's eyes narrowed when the yellow flash of his power was consumed by an even greater flash of purple. Sand was kicked up high into the air, blocking everything within from view. Laxus took a hurried few steps away from the edge of the cloud, weary of any sort of surprise attack. Once he felt he was at a safe distance, he allowed his emotions to leak through his combat. Did she just try a soul extinctor at that range? He muttered, one yellow eyebrow inching upwards. That's one crazy way to block an attack. I didn't block. A deep, gravely voice echoed from the dust cloud. When Myra Jane walked out of the settling cloud, her features were completely different. The woman had grown a foot in height, only half of which came from the large white manet flowing off her head behind the giant yellow horns that stuck out the side. A long blue and white trench coat fluttered behind her in the breeze, and grey metal gauntlets with gleaming claws mounted her arm up to the elbow. There wasn't any need to. Laxus hastily backpedaled firing off a, a few bursts of lightning to try and cover his retreat as he moved. Myra Jane batted them aside with almost contemptuous ease as she strolled after him. It's funny isn't it? I lose my powers for a few years, and somehow everyone forgets just how strong I am. Besides skill darts, I am the only person that Makarov has ever banned from using her full power. And that was for the transformation a step below this one. He just felt that the ban here just went without saying. So, I can't use my full strength four months and months before I lose my powers, and now everyone just thinks that regular old Satan soul is where it ends. Myra paused her speech for a moment to deflect another bolt and then dash forwards, capturing Lax's hand in her own. With a small twist, the dragon slayer was brought down. To his knees. I bet most people in the guild can't even remember this form. Do you remember its name Laxus? Gur, Satan Soul, Citri. Oh, you do remember. How sweet. The girl said brightly, her giggle sounding more like someone attempting to gargle rocks than anything else. I think I'll be needing to use this a bit more often, just to get the voice distortion back under control. It really strains the throat, you know. Ha! Huh. Laxus roared, startling Myra Jane out of her musings. The man pumped every last bit of his magic through his crystal, swelling his body to the absolute limit. Just the sudden bulge in size alone was enough to free him from Myra's grip, and then she was wide open. Dragon Slayer's Secret Art Roaring Thunder Crack Thuyum Like Natsu, the Dragon Slayer's secret art was Lax's most powerful attack, at least without the boost that setting up Thunder Palace provided. 
It is a lightning-enhanced fist, unleashing the full extent of his destructive capabilities, condensed into a single blow. And this time, it was supercharged. Laxus could feel his lacrima's charge run dry, completely spent in that one blow until it could recharge. But it was worth the extra power. Not even Satan's soul, Citri was able to stay on its feet from the impact. Myra was sent hurtling into the cliffside with such force that she carved a hole with her body three meters deep. Her ribs were seared and cracked, and her blood was starting to pool in her mouth. A confident smile tugged on Lax's lips when he heard the groan of pain that came from her extracting herself from the indent she left in the stone. Practice what you preach, Myra. You underestimated me the same way you said I did to you. I didn't underestimate you at all. Just that thing in your chest. Myra countered. For someone so obsessed with power, what does it say about you that you have to rely on such a crutch to battle at this level? Says someone who steals the souls of demons for her power. He growled. This is the power that my father sent to me. He entrusted it to me, for when I needed it. He wanted to help make me strong, even when he couldn't be here himself. But it's not your power, just something that was given to you. Whereas, my demon souls are something I made mine. Just something to think about when you wake up. Then Myra Jane moved and Lax's vision turned black. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Goku asked, a touch of concern in his tone. Appreciated, but completely unhelpful right now. Don't worry about me, I'm just, relaxing. Urza replied, trying to push her emotions through her words. Okay, he shrugged and stuffed another chunk of meat into his mouth. How the hell did the Saiyang race survive? If Goku was a typical example of them, their reproduction rate must have been abysmal. Rage meter 23%. Reload, try again. Urza allowed a gust of wind to take her napkin off of her lap and untangled herself from Goku so that she could bend down to retrieve it, her back half aimed directly at Goku's face. She took her time, leaning down far slower than necessary to emphasize her movements and peeked out of the very corner of her eye to see his reaction. He didn't seem to notice, too absorbed in picking a large bone out of his teeth. They were a warrior race, right? Maybe they just courted like cavemen, find a person who interests you, club them over the head, and take them home. She still had the titania power, she could probably pull that off without too much of an issue. Her fingers flexed slightly, but, no. Maybe not resort to that. Yet. Rage meter 38%. Reload, try again. Rather than returning to her seat, Urza moved Goku's plate off of his lap and onto the log and then sat down on top of him. She pressed her back flush against his chest, squirming around until she had maximized physical contact. Ah, Urza. You are far more comfortable than the log Goku. She breathed into his ear. Oh, okay. I'll remember to get some cushions or something. He was trying to be sweet. He was trying to be sweet. He didn't deserve to be stabbed, he was trying to be sweet. Just try again. Somehow, in the next couple of minutes her blouse lost the top three buttons, bringing her visible cleavage down to near the middle of her chest. He noticed her goosebumps on her chest. Good. Then he offered to go get her a blanket so she could bundle up. Rage meter 57%. Reload, try again. He handed her another piece of fish, along with a napkin to wipe up the hot butter she had spilled down her front. Rage meter 76%. Reload, try again. He gave her a funny look and turned back to his food. Rage meter 95%. Potential homicide detected. Desperate measures initiated. Urza spun around in her seat grabbed Goku's head, and pulled him into a hug that had him going headfirst into her boobs. Hey! Urza, what's the big idea? He yelled. His arms began to flail, not enough to dislodge her but enough to show that he was uncomfortable. He actually had no clue what she was doing. Rage meter 100%. Limit breaker, unleashed. Urza ripped Goku off of her, and pulled the both of them to their feet, eye to eye just inches apart. I am attempting to show that I am interested in a romantic, and possibly physical relationship with you, you exceptionally thick fool. I am attracted to you. She gave him a hard shake after each sentence as punctuation. I care for you, both for your character, and for all that you have done for me since we have met. I wish to get closer to you and see if we are compatible for spending our lives together, as more than friends. Do you understand? She snapped, her breath heaving. Goku stared at her in wide-eyed shock, his brain scrambling for something to say, eventually his survival instincts stepped in and picked up the slack. I like you too Urza, he blurted. Um, I don't really know a lot about romance and stuff, but I'll give it a shot if you want to. Urza looked him in the eye for a long moment before she nodded sharply good enough. She grabbed him by the back of the head and pulled him into a searing kiss. Goku, completely inexperienced, just quickly tried to copy her, hoping that would be enough. After a few moments Urza pulled away, her face red and breathing heavily, but with a large smile on her face. Tomorrow, meet me at the guild at noon. We'll go on another date. She said firmly. Then with a wave, she turned and walked back through the woods towards Fairy Hills. 
That was a date. Goku wondered after she had gone out of sight. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
That makes the score 78 grey, 75 natsu, and 106 ties. The cat did a barrel roll. That's Suyuuks. Natsu groaned. That's 10 ties in a row. Grey muttered, panting hard as his heart rate began to slow. I'd like something a bit more conclusive sometime soon. If we can't kick each other's ass anymore, that just means we're getting too tough for anyone else to do it. Just wait till those trials roll around, we'll show everyone what we are worth. All this training will pay off, and we'll never be benched for any of the crazy cool missions ever again. I really do want to catch up. Gray admitted. Goku, Myra, Urza, they've left us behind. Even some of the others, have you noticed the boost they got from those demons? Gray shook his head. Bunch of cheaters. Natsu mumbled. We'll do it. We'll pass them, and we'll finally become S-class. Suddenly, Gray's nose wrinkled as he realized he who was being civil to. Obviously, I'll be S-class first. The hell you will Natsu snapped back, but the fire wasn't quite back yet. Can you imagine the look on Urza's face when we take her down for our graduation? Especially after she just managed to take out Goku. We'll show everybody that we can handle missions like the Eration Cease thing. We could have taken those guys out no problem. Damn straight. Grey grinned as he pulled himself up to his feet and brushed some dirt off his knees. Crap where were his pants? Hey Happy, what's the time? He asked up to the flying cat as he searched for the lost article of clothing. Nine o'clock sir, the cat's face turned sly. Better hurry up, Juvia wanted you to meet her for some breakfast remember? Gray's face turned, complicated. You know, when Juvia grabbed Wendy yesterday and dragged her off to go shopping. The one thing I heard before she got out of sight was Big Blue Family. She lili i you tilde happy crowed. Yeah, I think I noticed. Gray muttered. I don't suppose you can see my pants from up there. Why bother? Happy shot back, grinning wickedly. Juvia won't mind. I will. Gray grumbled, turned lifting up a nearby boulder and finding his pants beneath it. How had? No, never mind. Same time tomorrow, flame brain, he called, struggling into them. Yeah, I got nothing planned. Kick your ass tomorrow, icicle head. Natsu waited a moment, then grinned at the middle finger Gray flipped up over his back. It was really nice to have a friend arrival who understood so well his inner need to hit things. His morning workout out of the way, Natsu collected Happy and started his own walk towards the guild hall. Now he just had to figure out his own plans for the rest of the day. Maybe a good run after breakfast to work up a sweat, and then some thrashing around in the guild until he could pick a fight with someone interesting. Most of the guild still wasn't back, but Laxus was still in town with the Thunder tribe for the moment. They almost never stuck around that long, so he hadn't had much a chance to fight any of them. It could be a pretty fun afternoon. Or maybe Gajil and those phantom mage friends of his would be up for a match, without Juvia this time. His musing carried on through his walk until he was well into town and nearly back to the guild. Natsu the fire dragon slayer pulled up short in the middle of the street. Laxus stepped out from an alleyway, and the serious expression on his face nearly curbed any kind of quick reaction Natsu might have normally given. You okay there, Laxus? You look like someone just killed your pet or something. Nearly. Laxus rolled his shoulders and sighed before he motioned the pink-haired mage to join him in between the buildings. He took a breath looked Natsu dead in the eye, and shoved a ball of lightning straight down the fire dragon's throat. Happy screamed out in shock and sprouted his wings, throwing himself straight at Lax's face with his claws extended. The blonde neatly plucked the flying cat out of the air by the scruff of his neck and waited silently as Natsu managed to cough down the glowing yellow ball and began breathing somewhat normally again. Natsu's hand caught fire. 
Laxus deflected the punch with his free arm and then chucked Happy at Natsu's face, forcing the Pinkette to break off his attack to catch his friend. Once the blue cat was secure, Natsu tossed him up into the air to hover above the pair and ignited his hands a second time. What the hell was that for you bastard? He snarled. Laxus ignored the question, staring intently at Natsu's hands for a long moment. Then, just before Natsu lost his temper and attacked, Laxus broke out into a wide grin and gestured down at Natsu's hands. Looks like it's taking after all. Natsu's brow scrunched up in confusion, and his eyes shifted to follow the blonde's gaze. Yellow sparks of electricity were intermingled within his fire. What, what the hell? What did you just dash? I'm leaving. Laxus interrupted. Natsu's jaw snapped closed, his eyes wide. I'm heading out on a training trip, and that would have just held me back. I need to make sure that I'm able to get stronger on my own merit. And you, follow whatever path you want Natsu. Just make sure that you're strong enough that you can live by your choice, no matter what. That was the ether ion crystal that made me the lightning dragon slayer. Keep that thing or spit it up, I don't care. But I'm sure that you'll figure out how to use it eventually, probably. When I get back, we can have that fight that you've been dying for, and we can see just how strong you've become. Good luck Natsu. Get strong. Natsu stood gaping, trying to process the new power that had literally just been shoved down his throat. The ether ion was sitting in his gut like, well, like a rock. Happy hovered behind his head, scratching his head with one paw. By the time either managed to process what had just happened, the blonde smirked at the pair and vanished in a flash of lightning. Did, did I just become a double dragon slayer? Natsu wondered. That raised far more questions than either cat or dragon knew how to answer. Happy thought for a long moment. Oh boy, now you can burn down the house and blow out the lights at the same time, the cat beamed. Forget that, tomorrow I'm gonna electrocute that squinty bastard's pants off. Natsu threw his fist into the air and let the power surge through him, promptly electrocuting himself. He hit the ground twitching. Nice start. Happy nodded. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Her gaze wandered with her mind, slowly gliding over the scenery and just taking in everything around her as she walked. Then her eyes fell onto a set of tracks along the same path. The grass was flattened down, like a group of people had come through this way. Yet, there was no return tracks, despite this being the only maintained path that lead to Goku's home. So, Goku had guests of some manner visiting. It would explain his absence, but now it raised the question of who would be going to visit him. Urza's stride lengthened, as she reached the foot of the hill that Goku's house rested behind. Wondering to herself wouldn't help anything, not when the answer was practically a spear throw away. Then she saw the fresh scorch marks that had burned away half of the trunk at the top of the hill, and suddenly she was running. The area around Goku's home was a war zone. The ground had been torn up, with deep divots crisscrossing every which way around the yard. Grass was torn up, rocks were laying in pieces, and the entire front of Grandpa Gohan's old home had collapsed. Urza's blade was in her hand now, and her magic was coursing through her body and ready to change her armor with an instant's notice. The Blackwing armor maybe. She needed to get high, Goku probably tried to move the fight away from his house and from the city as quickly as he could to limit collateral damage. She just had to find out which way he went. With a flash of light, Urza's clothes shifted and she took to the sky. There was no damage outside of the immediate confrontation area, but Goku was fast. He likely was able to lead his attackers on a merry chase before he brought them to a location of his choosing. There was no battle damage outside of the clearing in any direction, and the entire area seemed deserted. There was no more scorching from KI blasts or magic beyond what was immediately visible. The only tree in the area that appeared to have taken a hit was the one that she had already seen, not so much as a leaf on any other had been disturbed. There weren't any tracks leaving the battlefield either, and Goku knew how to fly. Urza pulled up and widened her circle around the area, scanning desperately, until she saw a flash of orange laying in the mud on the riverside. The redhead dove downwards and landed right beside the four-star dragon ball, painted to look like it had before the wish had changed it to stone. Goku had decided to dress it up for its place on Gohan's little memorial until the orb regained its original form. She had even helped him find a place to buy the paint. Paint that was now smeared and runny. The chances of Goku leaving the ball to sit in the mud, even in the middle of a fight, were virtually non-existent. He had not walked away from this battle. The trees shook with the wind as Urza took flight. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Sue had charged through the doors, bows in tow, and had dragged Juvia out of the room with a giggle of girl talk. Gray sympathized deeply with the grown bows, had let out, as he was dragged right back out the door. The small crystal of ever-frozen ice on Gray seemed to twinkle on his chest, as though it was laughing. Gray cradled it in his hand gentle, a soft smile on his face. Yeah, I bet you'd be find this whole thing hilarious you're. Wonder what kind of advice you'd have for me though. We never really got around to this kind of thing before you left. Wish we could just talk about, I think I'd even be able to stand the teasing. For a brief moment Gray thought he left a flash of warmth from the necklace. He stared down at it for a long moment before tucking it back into his shirt. Thanks for the talk. He said quietly before wandering over to join Natsu and happy at their own table in the corner of the guild. Natsu was clutching a light bulb and staring at it, ignoring everything else, as Happy seemed to be cheering him on. Myra Jane was sitting with Launch and talking amongst themselves over the bar. Lucy and Kana were playing some sort of card game, and Gajil was, holding a pair of kittens and eyeing them with an intense focus. Gray didn't know what to make of that last thing, so he ignored it. But somehow, the most chaotic duo in the guild had been sitting by themselves without getting into any antics at all. That alone could normally be cause for concern, let alone the serious expressions on their faces, as whispered back and forth. All right, where's the fire? Cat and Dragon both turned to stare flatly at the dumb grin on Gray's face. From across the room, Myra Jane curled up a napkin that she had been using as a coaster and beamed the ice mage in the back of the head without a single pause in her talk. Dumb puns were such a great way to get a reaction out of people. Seriously though, you look like something's bugging you man. What happened? And what's with the light bulb? Natsu's eyes shifted around the guild to see if anyone was still looking at them, then he reached out and yanked Grey into the booth. Is the grabbing necessary? Grey shot out. Natsu gave a single nod, held the light bulb in front of his face and scowled. After a moment, the light bulb lit up. Grey blinked. Is this some kind of trick? No. Natsu grinned. I got a free level up. Laxus just left and shoved the lightning lacrima that made him a dragon slayer down my throat on his way out the door. Oh, ha. Huh. Grey blinked. That's, ha. Huh. How does that feel? Mostly the same I guess, but my magic just feels a lot more. Like, everything is supercharged. You're going to need to step up your game man, with this kind of boost you're way behind now. Great. The hell's the problem then? You two are ducking down here like there's something awful going on. Normally you'd be swinging from the rooftops from something like this. Yeah but, it's Lax's power why I know. Didn't even have to fight anything for it, or do anything really. I just have lightning now. I'm going to need to start carrying dryer sheets around. Happy mumbled under his breath. Pets and hugs are going to make me all frizzy now. Gray ignored Happy and focused on the pinkhead instead. Dude, practically everyone in the guild lately, has had extra magic forced on them in some way shape or form. You probably got a better deal out of it than most of the others. If it's really that much of an issue for you that you didn't do anything for it, then go challenge Urza or something and see how well you can match up now with this. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take on everybody man, and I'll show them the power of the lightning fire dragon slayer. I'll fight Urza, and Myra Jane, and Goku, and Gildarts, and I'll impress them so much that they'll just make me S-class on the spot. That way you can go take the test on your own without having to worry about how the best you could do is second place. Natsu exclaimed, his excitement growing with each word. The teen leapt out of his chair in a burst of sparks and thrust out his finger to point dramatically at Myra Jane. The dragon slayer's grin only grew, as he felt everyone's eyes turn towards him. Myra Jane. I'm challenging you to AFI dash, the door blew off its hinges as Urza crashed into the building with a shower of splinters. 
Goku's gone. The redhead roared, eyes wide with panic. Myra Jane groaned. Damn it, Urza, you said things went well last night. What the hell did you do that scared him so bad he fled in the middle of the night? He was abducted, Myra. His house was destroyed, the grounds were torn up, and this was left lying in the mud. Urza shouted Myra Jane down and shoved the four star ball in her face. We need to track down the people responsible down right now. I have dealt with having friends taken away far more than enough for a lifetime, I won't lose any more. Her voice dropped down from burning anger to arctic hatred in an instant. Cold, remorseless eyes scanned the room. Where is the master? Old man hasn't come back since he sent almost everyone off. Launch replied. Think he decided to take it as a mini vacation. Then we shall simply have to go ourselves. Kana, I assume that your tarot reading will allow you to track Goku fairly easily. The drunk shrunk slightly at the intensity of Urza's gaze and drew out her deck of cards as quickly as she could. Don't worry, I'll have a general location in just a couple of minutes. She blurted out quickly. Urza nodded in satisfaction. Is this everyone here, or are there any other mags in town? She asked the group. Nobody else but Juvia and Wendy have come in here today, but some of them might have turned up at some point. Kana hedged. Very well. You all have twenty minutes. Assemble the troops. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
making their job endlessly harder, and ruining their every attempt to make things better. But in the long run, if she could achieve her goal, if she could cast her spell and send her current mind back to the past, then everything would be worth it. She could use all of the insider knowledge of the biggest criminal organizations in the world and dismantle them in under a year. She could protect all of the innocents that she had been forced to bring ruin and make the world better for the common people. Nothing worth doing was easily achieved. Alti bit down her distaste in her current companions as they dropped Sun Goku unceremoniously into his cell and then moved to take position to fight off the inevitable counterattack. The woman had been careful. She hadn't let any members of Grimoire's heart, not even Miri, know of her current location. If Hades found out her plan, everything would become a thousand times more difficult. Now, all she had to worry about was keeping this group of revenge-obsessed fools off of her back for just a few more hours until the moon rose game up. After the fellows left the room, she sealed the cell, carefully checking every last lock and seal was activate and running full strength. There could be no last-minute escape and no room for error. The brunette very carefully did not look down at the bloody form of her prisoner as she finished her check and turned to begin activating all of her traps. It would all be worth it. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
just because this Goku fellow was foolish enough to get kidnapped. Kala, fairy tale is our family now. The girl shot back. Aren't families supposed to stick up for each other? I mean, yeah, said Bose. But the cat's kinda got a point about the danger. Whoever these people are, if they brought down Goku, they aren't going to be messing around. I don't care. Wendy stomped her foot and Bose blinked as a stiff breeze blew around the room. If if these people are so dangerous, then that means Juvia and the others will be in danger too. I don't have to fight them, I have support magic. I can help them fight and heal them if they're hurt. She turned up her chin, pouting. I'm going, and none of you can stop me. Bose frowned and shared a look with Sue. Wendy hadn't been with them long, but she'd been a sweetheart since the moment she walked in. Neither of them really wanted to get involved in the fight that was no doubt about to go down, but at the same time, they weren't really about to let her walk off into it. She's a dragon slayer. He pointed out. They'd both hung around Gajil for years. Dragon slayers tended to be as tough as they were stubborn, and despite her stature, he got the feeling Wendy was going to prove no different. Sue crossed her arms and sighed. Tell why I what, Wendy. I hear what you're saying, so we're not going to stop you. In fact, we'll come with you. You will. Wendy beamed. We will. Bose asked. Sue shot him a flat look. You wanna be the one to tell Juvia we let her go running off after them unsupervised. I mean, he scratched the back of his head. Technically, she asked you to look after her. Sue raised an eyebrow at him. And do you really think for one second that I won't drag you down with me? Bose considered this for half a second. Before climbing to his feet. Well when you put it that way, what are we waiting for? We've got some idiots to help. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
I'm afraid that disables pretty much the entire repertoire of tools both you and your friends have for freeing you. Altir watched as Goku's gaze roamed around his prison before his eyes settled at the runes directly below his feet. His finger lit up in a little trickle of K.I. as he leaned down and began to rub at the runes, perhaps his energy could scuff it up. The light vanished unceremoniously into the tile. Goku looked at the light for a moment before he sent another trickle of power into his finger and tried the same thing with the next tile in the row. No luck. How's the shoulder? He asked conversationally as he began to work his way down the line. When the fight had started, he'd immediately lost the ability to breath. He'd caught sight of that air mage, Bellows, in the crowd she'd brought to fight him. At least that explained why he'd started suffocating the last time he'd attacked her. He wondered how long the assassin had been working for her. He'd tried to disrupt the air mage's assault like last time, but the others she'd brought with her had closed in on him. It had been an action-packed twenty seconds before his brain shut down. The faces and attacks had swum together with block spots in his vision, but he seemed to remember grabbing the time mage by the arm and swinging her around to bash a couple of his attackers. I have recovered. She said slowly, her hand rising to the shoulder and squeezing it gently. She shook her head. Tell me, do you have any great regrets in your life? Things that you wish had gone differently, something that you would change if only you had the chance. Goku frowned. All tears sounded wistful, with underpinnings of desperation, resolution, and more than a little anger. He wasn't having much luck with the runes yet, so perhaps it would be best to humor her until he thought of something else. One. Oh. My grandfather died, and it was my fault. I didn't listen to him and there was an accident. Altir nodded and Goku was surprised to see genuine sympathy in her eyes. I'm sorry. Sorry enough to let me go. Altir shook her head. When I was growing up, she began. I was one of the dozens upon dozens of children that are abducted from their families in this nation every year. My mother, she never even knew that I had been taken, my kidnappers faked my death, so convincingly that she never once even suspected that I might still be alive. She was a great mage, one of the greatest ice mags to ever live. That's why they took me. They believed that I carried the same magical potential and that they could use it to recreate lost magics. There were hundreds of experiments, Alti continued, Goku glanced up at the tremor in her voice. Her eyes were misted, and he could tell she wasn't looking at him anymore, but at a time long gone. Day in and day out, trying to force ever greater amounts of magic from me. I was burned, electrocuted, stabbed, and beaten. They believed that the greater the stress forced onto a mage, the greater the surge in power they would go through. She shuddered, an ugly look crossing her face, and they were right. My magic, the arc of time, is well beyond the capabilities of most mags alive. Once my power had awakened, escaping from them was far easier than I ever would have suspected. Or, at least, it seemed that way. She shook her head, her eyes narrowing. I found my mother. I should have run down there and hugged her. But, she had two boys with her, everything suddenly seemed cold. I thought she had replaced me with those boys, and I hated them. I hated her. My own mother. She shuddered. It was such a strong feeling, I actually went back to the scientists and let them keep working on me. It wasn't until years later that I realized that they had altered my mind as well as my body, that they had woven spells into my subconscious to ensure that I couldn't break free just by walking out the door. When I realized what they had done, I killed the entire group so that I wouldn't have a place to return to once I left and tried to go find my mother again. Instead of found a memorial. I'm sorry. Goku interrupted. Altia blinked and looked at him. I know how it feels to wake up one day and find someone you cared about is just gone. I still miss Grandpa Gohan every single day. He crossed his arms. But that doesn't explain what's happening here, 
He thrust his arm out to indicate the tiled prison. Why do you need my help so badly? The arc of time isn't complete. She answered promptly. It has a final form, one that I could never even hope to obtain through normal means. It's called Last Ages, the pinnacle of all time magic. With it, I can send my mind hurtling backwards in time and take the body of my younger self, as she stood on that snowy hillside and stared down on my mother. I'll be able to use my knowledge of the future to influence the past. With it I can save everyone. My mother, everyone in the Tower of Heaven, every person who has suffered at the hands of the Dark Guilds and everyone else. I've played a part in all the major Dark Guilds, I know their members, their strengths and weaknesses, my knowledge will bring them all tumbling down. It's certainly a nice idea. Goku said slowly. Helping all of those people, that doesn't sound so bad. But once things start changing, you won't know what's going to happen anymore, right? And even if you did, if what everyone goes through is different, are they really the same people anymore? Experiences make people, right? I don't think I'd be the same as I am now if I had met up with Fairy Tail. And you probably wouldn't have been the same person if you hadn't made all the choices you just said. Altia gave him a wan smile. I have already had that debate with myself enough times in the past. I concluded that as long as I help more people in doing this than I hurt, that it wouldn't matter. People might end up differently, but if I do more help than harm, I will have no qualms. At this point, my hands are so red that a few more are not going to cause me grief. The words a few more sent warning bells off in Goku's head. He started pouring more energy into the tiles he was testing. No point conserving his strength if he couldn't get loose anyways. You're about to do something unpleasant to me, aren't you? Altia flinched but met his gaze. She nodded. I give you my word that I shall ensure that you remain happy within the new timeline. That's nice. He commented, shaping his KI into a spike and attempting to drill it into one of the runes. But you haven't told the me right here what you need me for. I suppose I haven't, have I? I've been dancing around the topic so far, I admit. Would you like me to be blunt? Please. Using this spell would kill me. I need you to power it. Goku stared at her. It draws from life energy, not just magic, Altier went on. No living person has enough to even use a fraction of what the spell is capable of. That was part of why I joined the dark guilds that I did throughout my life, I was hoping that they would eventually lead me to Zeref. With his abilities, nullifying the cost would be child's play. But in the meantime, I sought his demons and the dragons. I was sure their power could fuel the spell just as well. She took a moment to look a little sheepish. If I am being honest, releasing Zeref upon the world so I could make it a better place seemed somewhat counterproductive. But the demons keep dying. Goku said, keenly aware that he was one of the ones responsible for breaking them. And who knows where the dragons went. So that leaves me. What makes me so special? Your K.I., Altir said. It is pure, concentrated life energy. The concentration is far beyond any mage that I have ever encountered throughout the land. Mags do not harness it, so our life forces tend to be weak. But you, you exercise your own life force like it is a muscle, and you grow more powerful for it. It's really quite fascinating. Altia shook her head. But you, and that giant monster form of yours, can provide all the power I need. I intend to drain it down to an empty husk and propel myself through history on its dying breath. Altia gestured up to the window over his head. In three hours, the full moons will rise. This glass is enchanted, not only to resist your attempts to break it, but also to magnify the light of the moon. You don't need to look up and closing your eyes won't save you. The second the light begins to shine, everything will finally be set right. The look of absolute relief on her face as she spoke that word, Goku's brow knitted as he thought. 
Altia clearly believed everything she was saying. Heck, she might even be completely right in how her plan would work. But still, I'd rather fight for my friends and my life my own way. Anyone that wants to fight me, or comes after me, I want to be able to meet them head on and battle it out when we are both at our best. Is that arrogance or honor? she asked. Regardless, comparing our methods thus far leaves you in a cage, and me on the cusp of victory. Altia brushed his statement off. The two sat in silence for several minutes after that, Goku testing each and every tile on the floor before moving onto the walls, while Altia remained content simply watching him to pass the time. A familiar feeling tickled the edge of Goku's senses, and a smile grew across his face. Altia took notice. As I assume you haven't just decided that you approve of my plan, would I be right to guess that your friends have just arrived? She asked. Feels like it. Goku grinned. Looks like they found me a bit sooner than you thought. I'll be out of here in plenty of time before the moon comes up. If clinging to that hope makes your final hours more bearable, that's perfectly fine. But I already told you that you cannot escape from this cage. She paused. Of course, I have been observing you and your guild, and I understand just how foolish it is to say there is something the fairies can't do. So, contingencies have already been put in effect. I could tell you about them, but it will be far easier to show you. Altia walked back to the wall behind her, and with a wave of her hand it lit up. Images from all around them compound burst into full color, showing in real time what has happening in every room. At the uppermost camera, Goku saw his friends burning away an entire town of ancient-looking ruins to reveal a metal-studded door beneath one of the buildings. Urzo annihilated the steel in an instant and the team stormed inside. Altia turned back to look at Goku with a grim smile. Which one do you think will be the first to fall? xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
She braced herself to face. Nothing. She was in a simple stone cylinder-shaped room. There was an open door on the far side, and absolutely nothing else of note. Scowling, Urza began stomping her way towards the exit when she felt something tap her on the back. The redhead spun around, her sword slashing at, nothing. Invisibility. Urza narrowed her eyes, twirled around and searching the ground for any sign of misplaced dust, her ears straining for any hint of movement. There was a sound like giant hand flicking the air. Another shot, this time off of her shoulder. Urza looked down to see a small spot of black goo marking where the attack had landed. There was a sound like a giant cork popping out of a bottle, and Urza twirled around at the noise. She slashed outward, but the gooey substance merely split on her sword and splattered against her armor. Growling, Urza reached up to wipe it away. Right before she could touch it though, the blot withered and began to grow. The goop wrapped around her elbow, locking it in place like super glue. Urza strained against the substance, even as she felt the ones on her back and shoulder begin to spread as well. There were more of those popping noises. She thrust out her other hand and summoned several dozen swords, spinning and slicing the air around her in a wall of lethal steel. The goo struck the blades and splattered her in droplets. They immediately began to bubble, sticking her legs to the ground. Urza's nostrils flared as she tried to force her neck to turn, tried to spot her opponent. The next shot was fired from directly in front of her, and Urza realized what was happening far too late. The walls, which she had dismissed just seconds ago, were littered with tiny holes, the tips of weapon barrels from which the substance was being fired. Then the shot hit her square between the eyes. Panicked now, Urza forced her hands up to her face to try to scrap the goo off, but instead they stuck fast, trapping her gauntlets directly in her line of sight. She could feel her swords slowing down as the goo weighed them down and stuck them together. She attempted to requip her armor, to shed the entrapping goo, but the moment her armor disappeared, the goo expanded even further, sticking to her skin and trapping her completely. With an anguished, scream of rage, Urza Scarlet was helpless, as she was slowly made into a statue of slime. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
I may be able to have her skip Phantom Lord altogether. On another screen, Kana and Lucy were facing off against a pair of giant lions with the faces of women. The two fairies were huddled together, locked in what looked to be a frantic argument, as the enormous cat stared at them. Another thing I intend to do when my spell is complete is locate that red key and dispose of it. Altia said. If Lucy Hartfilia never receives it, she cannot accidentally open the door for flute. She glanced back at Goku. Surely you can agree that would be for the best. Goku said nothing, too busy devoting his energy on escaping his unpleasant end to debate what IFS. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Altia shake her head sadly and turn back to the magic windows. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
as a glowing circle of light floated above his head. Come, Myra Jane the demon. He intoned, his words ringing with a righteous serenity, as he stared down at her. Come and be crucified. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Have you never faced a foe who wielded divine power? Darkness always gives way to light, and demons are no different. Your magic cannot hurt me. She believed him. Which meant it was time for a different approach. Gathering her power, she formed another soul extinction and began to stalk towards him. Red rolled his eyes and raised his blades. Myra leapt at him and fired the spell behind her. The explosion of magic sent her hurtling forward faster than the winged man had expected. He had just enough time to widen his eyes before she performed a natsu, which is to say, she punched him in the face with all the force her magic could give her. There was a loud crack as Red shot backward, slamming into the wall as Myra flew with him. One hand squeezing the man's throat, she hauled back her fist for blow and froze. She couldn't move, her body felt full of lead as her eyes swiveled helplessly. Then she saw the sword. One of Red's fire swords was sticking out of her stomach. She looked at him and he spat out some blood and grinned. Seraphim soul, blade of demon's chain. He put one hat against her face and pushed her off. She fell to the floor, one hand still curled as though grasping his throat with the other a drawn back fist. Red stood over her, his nose clearly broken, and his wings disheveled. He stared at her thoughtfully for a moment, then sneered and drove his other blade through her chest. It was like being turned to stone. She could feel the blade inside her, burning like ice. Whenever anyone talks about takeover mags, everyone always talks about the Strauss siblings. Red sneered. I always knew you'd never match up. It doesn't matter what you do, how much you power up, or what soul you take on. A demon is still a demon and these blades will not let you go. His body lit up and his wings disappeared as he released the seraphim soul. And with that, I think I'm done with you. He stepped over her and she tried to shout at him, but her jaw and tongue wouldn't move, all that came out was a wet grunt. Red paused. Oh, wait. He turned back, drew back his leg and kicked her, sending her rolling away painfully, her body still stuck in the awkward pose. That was for my nose, bitch. The takeover mage turned away and strode of the chamber. Enjoy your new home. Myra listened as his footsteps faded away, alone and frozen as the blades flickered in the dim lighting of the chamber. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
The hell? Was Jose doing here? The man was standing in the middle of the room and staring at Natsu's struggles hungrily. He looked a bit different, more demented and gaunter, as though he hadn't been eating for weeks. And he was winning. It had taken the former wizard saint less than two minutes to pin him down and smother him in shadows. The man hadn't even moved, hadn't so much as twitched since Natsu had stepped into the room, but the shadows had moved for him. Natsu could see a black jewel around the mage's neck, blacker than night, that seemed to suck in all the light around it. The jewel seemed to grow darker whenever the shadows moved, blocking his attacks, cutting off his advances, swallowing up all the rage and fire he could muster, and now, they were killing him. This wasn't even a fight, there was just nothing he could do. Deep inside Natsu's heart, thunder began to rumble. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Far above the complex, the air began to churn as a point of incredible heat ignited a football field's length from near glacial temperatures. In their respective rooms, a storm of fire and electricity cut through the shadows like tissue paper, burning it away to reveal a young, pink-haired man with scales growing down out of his face. His eyes had turned hard and reptilian, and there was a fire in his belly as the demented grin on Jose's face froze. Elsewhere, the necklace that had long lay dormant around Gray's neck began to spread, firing off waves of cold that changed the air pressure and pushed what little oxygen was left in the area directly towards Gray's head. His magic reacted in cinch with that of his teachers trapping the air in a canister that he formed around his back and connected it to a full face mask that left only his hair exposed. Hair that was slowly turning white as frost began to spread out across his body, slowing coating the floor. The floating man cocked his head curiously, looking interested. Unknown to either, the two fairies moved in perfect unison as they rose to their feet and pointed confidently at their opponents. Don't even think about counting me out of this just yet. Two voices roared. There are people counting on me to win, and I'm not about to let some lackey stand in my way. All around them, the world sang a song of ice and fire. Chapter 52 Times Turn Part 3, Indestructible xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
I suggest you sit quietly, recover, and just wait this out. There is no need to keep torturing yourself before the end. At the very least, you can try to stay comfortable. As Goku watched, she turned back to the screens. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
the assassin could do nothing as he plummeted back to the ground and shattered into a thousand glittering shards. After a few moments the blue light petered out, and Grey hunched over with his hands on his knees as his icy helmet fell away. He took a deep gulp of air fresh air, reveling in the fact that it wasn't trying to kill him anymore. He took a moment, probing his energy reserves, he felt like he'd just come out an all-night, all-out fairy tale brawl. But, he'd won. Grey grasped the necklace and smiled fondly. Thanks you're. He murmured. Couldn't have done it without you. With a wave of his hand, the ice that was covering each of the doors in the room vanished, and Grey began to look back and forth between them. All right, where the heck am I supposed? To go now. Got a bit turned around there, not sure which door I came in through. That one maybe. Grey hesitated for a moment, indecisive. Then a flash of heat washed over his face, and Grey looked through the hole in the roof to see a massive pillar of fire mixing with the snowstorm he had caused and sending flaming, electrocized balls of hail pelting to the ground. That's probably the right way. Grey chuckled to himself as he slipped out the door. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
then you are far and away his superior. However, the lights across the walls blinked out as one. The room nearly fell into total darkness, the sole exception being the blaze surrounding the dragon slayer's form. The shadows writhed all around them, dancing up into the air like a gelatinous sludge. They curled themselves around Jose, seeping into his paws and engulfing his limbs. Natsu watched as the shadow mage's eyes flashed red before he was completely devoured by the magic. A wizard saint, Jose, or the thing that had been Jose, hissed. Already one of the most powerful forces walking the planet, signing a contract with the demons of hell for a chance at revenge. Greater power than I could ever hope to achieve, than you could ever hope to achieve. While I may no longer be dealing with a normal dragon slayer, you will find that you are facing something far, far worse. A true devil. Prove it. Gra. Streaks of shadows exploded out of Jose's cocoon. Black and red tendrils twisted through the rom, keeping well clear of Natsu's flames even as rose up around the room like a whirlpool. Whispers began to trickle out from the darkness, just barely reaching Natsu's ears. As the tide of shadows grew taller, the noise grew louder. A cacophony of anguished moans and wails sounded from the substance at Natsu's back, and the fire dragon turned his head over his shoulder to see a half-decayed man fall from the darkness. The creature snarled through rotten, yellowed teeth and pulled a rusty blade from its hip. Another squelch came from Natsu's left. And a broken woman holding a crystal staff chattered her teeth at him. Natsu's flames curled around him as more and more bodies dislodged from Jose's magic and surrounded him. The shambling horde snarled and roared as the dark mage's laughter echoed through the room. The bodies and souls of those who have broken packs with the demons are at my beck and call. My undead shall tear you to pieces, and you shall scream in agony as you become yet another part of the horde. Now, kill him. One of the resurrected mags blurred like jet, tackling Natsu to the ground. As the rest of its brethren surged forwards, the monster leaned in, its jaw aimed straight at Natsu's exposed throat. With a harsh crunch, its teeth slammed shut, and shattered uselessly against the scales that were still spreading down his body. Right before the first wave added their bodies to the dogpile, a spark lit on the first one's chest. Fire lightning dragons roasting bath. The first body was instantly incinerated, while a half dozen others around the room caught fire. Not a single one reacted, as what little remained of their flesh began to melt and their muscles boiled. As Natsu hopped back up to his feet the next zombie reached him, a large man, who pushed magic through his body to make his muscles swell and bring his body up to a towering ten feet tall. The behemoth threw a haymaker at the pinkette's head. Natsu easily moved to the side, grabbed him by the wrist, and chucked the monster into a trio of its friends. The smaller ones were crushed beneath the weight of the monster, popping like grapes. As the giant tried to clamber back up, Natsu landed a blazing knee straight to its jaw, then used the top of its head like a springboard to launch himself into the next creature, in line even, as the first began to burn away. A razor whip shot towards Natsu's back, and instantly melted away on contact. The mage didn't even notice the failed attack and plowed straight through a flailing wood mage. A water mage tried to extinguish his flames, and an arc of lightning went straight back up the current and blew the fragile phantom's torso in two. An enchanted sword fared no better on Natsu's scales than the zombie's teeth, and with a quick movement he snagged part of the fragmented blade out of the air and turned it white hot before burying it into a magical boxer. Hey Jose, maybe next time don't make all your minions so flammable, idiot. Fire Dragon's Blazing Twister Natsu slammed his fists onto the ground and a spinning tornado of fire. Dozens of bodies flew through the air, and Natsu leapt right after them, blasting straight through the next wave before the previous could even land. The next fighter threw a haymaker, and with a quick chop Natsu found himself holding a severed limb at just below the shoulder. Both the dragon slayer and the zombie looked at one another, down at the limb, and back up again. The zombie began to whine, gesturing helplessly at its arm. Natsu swung it like a club, 
and knocked the creature's head straight from its shoulders. The head screamed as it flew through the air, then was abruptly cut silent when it beamed another of its kind between the eyes and the stunned beast fell on top of it. Come on, Jose, get out here and fight me yourself. I can keep tearing through these idiots all day, all you're doing is letting me get into the swing of things. A gunner mage was fed their own weapon, a sand mage was melted down to glass, a hammer-wielding woman had her torso caved in, and zombie after zombie followed them. But the shadows only created more. The red veins running through the shadows were beginning to thicken, and Jose's cocoon was starting to look redder than black. Natsu's eyes narrowed. You know, part of me really wants to see what you're doing in there. I figure you're probably using a whole bunch of magic to turn yourself into some sort of giant shadow demon or something, right? But as cool as that might sound, I don't have time for that right now. I won't let you finish. Natsu blitzed forward, scattering the zombies when a shadowy whip cracked out and wrapped itself around his neck. The teen jerked back at the sudden pressure on his windpipe, and the zombies around him rushed in, finally finding an opening. The horde grabbed his arms, grabbed his legs, and began to pull. Lightning, darkness, flashes of magic of every color of the rainbow arced out and bombarded his body as the creatures tried to pull out his joints. Then, a wizened-looking woman with a long face and clothing from a time long forgotten, a time before any dragon slayers walked the earth, unleashed a giant stream of purple flames right into the pile of bodies. No. Jose groaned from within the pod. The flames turned bright orange and began to compact before it disappeared completely within the swarm. Bang! Suddenly, Natsu was standing alone, smoke curling off of his body, and out of his mouth as he let out a long, tried. Exhale. Now, I've got a fire in my belly. Dragon Force theme. Ra. The electricity in Natsu's attack turned down to a trickle as his flames consumed all. The zombies burned away, and the shadows around the room began to pull back as Natsu's light burned brighter than ever. Ha! The roof exploded outward as a massive column of flames pushed its way out of Natsu's body, eradicating all the shadows, incinerating the creatures that it had spawned, and sending Jose tumbling out of his cocoon. The former guild head now looked half man, half monstrosity. Dark fur covered half of his body, and his mouth had turned to look like the muzzle of a wolf. One eye had grown wide and bright yellow, with bulging veins running through it. But Natsu's eyes were drawn to the crystal on Jose's necklace. It had sunk halfway into his chest and looked like it was trying to worm its way further. Every fairy knew what a big glowing target looked like. Come on ugly. I am going to take you down in one punch. Gra? Fool, even with half of a demon's power, I'm still more than enough for you. The two rushed straight for one another, shadows and flames swirling together, as they came head to head with their fists pulled back. Demonic dead wave. Fire dragon's iron fist. Their hands slammed together, cracking the floor and walls with the force of their power. Purple and red battered one another, pushing for dominance. Wails of rage and agony poured out of the jewel on Jose's chest, fueling his power and pushing him to even greater heights. Yet, it is still Jose's feet that slid back first. The guild master scrambled, trying to call forth the power of his master as much as he could, but his unstable body couldn't regulate their power, nor even fully control his own. His feet dragged back another couple of inches. Jose looked up past his fist, up towards Natsu's face, and saw the form of a massive red dragon growling its dominance behind him. Fear filled his heart and the former guild master tried to break off the attack, tried to get free. Natsu's iron fist found the man's hesitance, and with a roar he pushed past the man's attack and pulled back his other arm. Hidden fire form crimson lotus, phoenix blade. Fire filled every corner of the room. Jose screamed in agony as the magical flames washed over him, eating at his skin and burning away the demonic magic that he had tried to encase himself in. His power faltered, his body shuddered. The crystal shattered. 
No. The dark mage screamed, even as the power fled his body. He was flung against the wall from Natsu's attack, and as he landed the shadows on the ground began to curl towards him. No. No. Natsu watched in shock as the shadows bubbled upwards, forming into a giant mouth. Jose scrambled to get himself off of the tongue, but his hands sunk into the bubbly blackness. No. Crutch. Part of an arm and half of a leg twitched wildly, sticking out from between the razor-sharp teeth. A pair of large eyeballs opened from the top of the shadow and stared directly at the fire mage. Natsu raised his fists, one crackling with fire and the other with lightning. The massive mouth curled up into some sort of twisted smile, and the eyes battered their lashes at him before fading away to nothing, taking Jose with it down to, wherever it came from. Natsu stood staring at the spot where it disappeared for a good while before he finally found his voice. Did, did that thing just try to flirt with me? It liaxed you, a voice said in his ear. Happy. Natsu jumped, blinking at the cat. The hell did you come from? Were you hiding? I, the cat said happily, flapping over to the place where the shadow creature had disappeared and poking the ground curiously. I don't like lightning. It makes my fur all puffy. You was, Natsu huffed. You could have helped me, why I know. I'm not fireproof, Natsu. Happy said reproachfully. Natsu raised a finger, then shrugged. Come on Happy, we got a friend to save. I sir. Good job on that mission, guys, Levi grinned. You were really on point back there. Come on, Levi, Jet laughed, you're the one who broke the mummy's curse. Yeah, but I couldn't have done it without the pharaoh's scepter and getting that was all you. Oh please. Jet smiled. Those booby traps guarding it were nothing, I was just too fast. I like how Droy tied up the mummy with vines. Did you see the look on its face? Levi smiled. It had been a while since she'd been able to go on a simple mission with the rest of Team Shadowgear. No ancient demons and giant monkey monsters no evil wizard saints coming down to destroy them all, and no horrible demons from another world. Just her, Jet, Droy, and a run-of-the-mill ancient curse that needed breaking. But the job was done, and it was time to get back to the guild. She wanted to find out if Urza had finally managed to ask Goku out, and if she'd been able to get him to understand what that meant. Levi wished Urza all the luck in the world and couldn't wait to ask Myra for all the juicy details. Yes, she was looking forward to a week of taking it easy. It was at this moment that the night sky was lit up by a brilliant pillar of icy magic that exploded far off in the distance. Team Shadowgear stopped at once, blinking at the sudden snowstorm. So, Jet said after a moment, How much you wanna bet that was grey? I mean, he's not the only ice mage in existence. Droy answered doubtfully. There's not necessarily a reason for us to get involved. There was an isplitting crack, and a red and yellow pillar of fire climbed into the sky. It struck a cloud burn straight through, turning the water in the air to steam. Well, Droy sighed. Nats is there too, then. Come on, guys. Levi said breaking out into a jog. They could need our help. Jet gave his friend a gentle pat on the shoulder. Sorry, dude, trouble's calling. Why don't you carry Levi on ahead? Droy said, waving him off. I'll catch up. Sure thing, man. Jet's became a blur as he took off after their leader, neatly scooping her off her feet and leaving a cloud of dust behind. Droy sighed. One mission. Just one mission without an explosion. Was that really too much to ask? He sighed again and broke out into a jog. 
xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Some of us actually like to make an effort. Will you shut up? The second sphinx snapped, shooting them each a glare before turning back to Lucy. Ask your riddle so that I can answer it and eat you and not share a bite with the sore loser. All right. Kana could see the wheels turning in her friend's head. Lucy's mouth opened and closed a few times before she came to a decision. She grinned at the sphinx and asked, What have I got in my pocket? The sphinx stared at her for a moment. That's not a riddle. Lucy crossed her arms and gave the cat a hard look. It's a classic. But if you don't like it, that's hardly my problem, is it? You going to answer or not? The sphinx sneered, looked her up and down. A celestial spirit key. Nope. Lucy's hand plunged into her skirt's pocket and pulled a piece of paper. There was a tiny image of Kana printed on it, holding an oversized phone over her head with a hopeful expression. It's a magic communication card. I call it the booty call card. Kana said proudly. It's not important what you call it. Lucy said, hurriedly shoving the card back into her skirt pocket. The point is that it wasn't a key. She pointed at the Sphinx. You lose. Kana grinned as the golden glow faded from the Sphinx's fur. Now let us pass. Fine. The monster spat, turning away from Lucy and looking at Kana. But I'm eating your friend. Hum. How about no? Lucy raised a key. Open, gate of the bull. Taurus materialized in a burst of smoke. Lucy. You look as munificently hot as always. Yeah, thanks. Lucy pointed at the Sphinx. She called me fat. What, the bull spirit roared. Steam shooting out his nose as he whirled on the giant cat. How dare you? Miss Lucy's body is a dream, the cowman threw himself at the cat, wrestled with it until he got his arms around its waist, then suplexed it into the ground. Taurus stood over the downed monster and flexed. I dedicate this victory to Miss Lucy's killer jugs. That's great. Lucy grimaced weakly, raising his key. By Taurus. The spirit vanished. Lucy pointed a second key at the first sphinx, who was eyeing the other in amusement. You want some? No? No, the sphinx waved her paw dismissively as she padded out of the way. You solved my riddle, therefore, you can pass. I have respect for tradition. Oh? Well, good. Lucy stepped toward the door on the far side of the chamber. Come on, Kana. Right behind YA, babe. They had almost reached the exit, when the door was flung open and a large, unkempt man stepped through. Good evening, Master Red. The Sphinx called politely. The man grunted, shooting Kana and Lucy an ugly look. Looks like I get the lion's share of the prey. Kana raised her cards and Lucy her keys, as his look turned into a leer. Take over magic, hail Hydra. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
Do you know anything else about who came here? Levi asked, glancing at the various passageways lining the cavern. They didn't split up, did they? We left after they did, so we didn't see. The bald phantom mage, booze. Supplied. But Wendy thinks they did. I don't think they did, I know they did. Wendy declared. I can smell it. All the pathways have only one scent walking down them, except that one. I think Kana and Lucy went down that one together. Levi frowned thoughtfully at her. Need I remind you that Wendy is a dragon slayer? Carla huffed. Her senses are far beyond your mere human ones. Right, sorry. Levi sighed, massaging her forehead in annoyance. One the one hand, splitting up was basically the stupidest thing her friends could have done. On the other hand, they were angry, and they were fairies, and so generally only had enough brains to hold on one thought, usually something along the lines of find someone who's asking for it and hit them. She glanced around at the passageways again, which one should? They go down. Who was the most likely to need help? I am going down this path. Wendy declared, pointing to the one she meant. Why? Carla demanded. I can smell Juvia down that way. The girl took another sniff. She doesn't smell right. Normally she smells like rain, but now she smells more like dust. Well, that's not ominous at all. Sue commented, but Levi could see the worry on the woman's face. Can you tell me about any of the others? Levi asked. I think. Wendy concentrated. I think Gajil went that way, she pointed. I can smell his iron and lots of it. I think he's fighting something. Well, we are probably better off not getting in his way then. Bose said. He'll be fine. Then. Wendy sniffed. Urza is down there and Myra is over there. Wendy pointed to two holes. I don't think either of them are moving. Levi swallowed. Urza and Myra not moving. When a friend was in trouble. Ridiculous. But if whoever had done this had taken down Goku. They didn't have time for hesitation. Levi made a snap decision. Jet, Droy, she called moving forward. We are going to check on Urza first. You got it, boss. Right behind you. Levi glanced back towards the other fairies, but Wendy was already marching down the path to Juvia, the two phantom mags scurrying behind. Levi bit her lip and moved faster. Natsu, Gray, and the others would have to hold out on their own. They were pretty good at that, but she hoped Lucy and Kana were watching each other's back and that they weren't meeting anything too dangerous. The man's body melted, his face elongating and turning emerald green. His arms and legs stretched out as scales sprouted along them and his fingers became fangs, then his legs followed suit. In moments, Kana and Lucy were staring at a mass of five serpentine heads, each one equipped with fangs that would fill a saber-toothed tiger with envy. Kana swallowed audibly. I don't think I was drunk enough to see something like that. SSSSR, if you can last more than a few seconds, will you? One of the heads hissed. Then all five heads surged towards them. Lucy's hand shot up. Taurus, get back out here. The bull spirit materialized brandishing his axe and brought it down on one of the snake heads, neatly vivisecting it. Blood splattered everywhere, as the head recoiled and two more shot out, one wrapping around the axe's pommel, and the other sinking its fangs into the spirit's shoulder. Taurus mood in distress, as he was pulled off his feet. It happened with such speed that Lucy could do little more than watch in horror, as a third head bit into the cowman's shoulder, and almost casually tore him in half. Taurus. She cried, reaching for another key. 
but the last remaining heads were already lunging for her with jaws open wide. She got a clear view of the dark red gullet when several pieces of paper flew past her and into the creature's mouth. Card magic, 5052 card pickup. There was a shuffling noise, and the head jerked back as cards began to fountain out of its mouth. The head shook wildly, trying to dislodge the mass of cards and gagging as they poured out of the opened maw like a waterfall of paper. Kana grabbed her and hauled her back across the chamber as Red shook off the pain. As Lucy watched, the head that Taurus had cut rose off the ground. The cut splitting it down the middle mending as she watched. So that's distressing. Kana commented. What do we know about hydras? Don't cut their heads off, they'll grow more. Hydras have some of the most potent venom in the world, Lucy said. The four heads turned toward the gagging one and helped rip out the still-expanding pile of cards, if those fangs so much as scratch us, we're dead. Kana eyed the foot-long fangs. Given the size of those chompers, I think venom is overkill, but okay, she glanced at Lucy. I don't suppose you know any weaknesses. Fire is supposed to stop the regeneration. And Natsu is nowhere to be found. Typical. Kana groaned, rooting around in her rucksack. Oh well, we'll just have to improvise. She pulled something out and tossed it to Lucy. Can you keep him busy while I do a thing? Lucy stared for a moment, then grinned. Red started to slither towards them again, all five heads hissing with fury. Lucy opened the thing Kana had tossed her and stuck a key into the opening. Open, gate of the water bearer. There was a flash and a wet explosion exploded. A water bottle. Aquarius screeched, towering over Lucy. In all my years, never have I had a summoner who showed me such. Scold me later. Lucy shouted back, pointing at the scaly monstrosity bearing down on them. Make him go away. Aquarius glanced over her shoulder, sneered, and raised her jug. Drown. For a moment, nothing happened. Aquarius frowned and gave the jug a shake. Then the jug let out an ear-splitting boom that echoed around the chamber. Water surged of the jug, sending the water-bearer staggering backward and nearly bowling Lucy over. The water struck red with a crunch, lifted his enormous body off the floor, and sent him hurtling into the far wall. Lucy stared, slack-jawed. She glanced over and saw her expression mirrored on Kana's face. Even Aquarius looked taken aback, eyeing her jug suspiciously. Have you been working out? The spirit demanded, glancing back at Lucy suspiciously. You look as flabby as ever, how are you supplying me with this much magic? I... I don't. It must because of flute. Kana exclaimed grinning. I'll be damned, you're a powerhouse now. Lucy blinked, staring at her hands in wonder. She'd known that her magic reserves had grown after the demon fiasco, but she'd never really had a chance to test out just how much. Summoning Aquarius away from the sea usually left her borderline tapped out, but she hadn't even broken a sweat. It had been a while since Lucy had a surprise that was actually pleasant. Well, whatever. Aquarius scoffed, putting her jug under one arm. You're still just a scrawny chit of a girl. How can I be scrawny and flabby? Lucy demanded indignantly. Don't ask me. The spirit sniffed. It's not my fault your body is a freak of nature. By the way, the lizard is getting up. I, what? Lucy turned her head and saw Red rising. Five pairs of eyes were staring at her with murderous promise. Well, blast him again. MMMM, now. Nah. What? Lucy squawked. I don't feel like it. Also, I'm pretty sure that water bottle was a violation of my contract. You're only supposed to summon me in actual bodies of water. That's not what the contract says. Lucy cried. Fine, fine. I'm taking a vacation day. Aquarius huffed. Oh don't look at me like that, you've got plenty of magic to burn. 
summon the alley cat or something. It's not my problem. With that, the spirit vanished. Red began to slither forward, snapping them both back to the immediate problem. Don't worry, Lou. I'm ready to do the thing. Kana appended her rucksack, spilling out cards across the floor. She pointed at the approaching monster. Card magic, house of cards. The bits of paper swirled up around the monstrous man, boxing in the writhing mass of scales and fangs with walls of paper. As the cards settled, they formed a house complete with makeshift doors and shingled roof. There was a momentary silence, and a glowing yellow eye stared out at them from a tiny window in the house. You cannot be so serious. Red hissed flatly. This ISSS, one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. Well just you wait. Kana yelled back, holding up a single card triumphantly. It's about to get even stupider. She flicked the piece of paper at the house. I call this one, burning down the house. The card struck the house and every card lit up with orange magic circles before exploding. When the smoke cleared, the snake head was sprawled across the floor, their scales blackened by fire and soot. How DYA like that? Kana cried, crossing her arms. If it's stupid, but it works. It ain't stupid. Then five sets of reptilian eyes snapped open and glared at her. But? Kana protested as Red pulled his heads off the ground. I thought hydras were supposed to be weak against fire. They are. Red shook his heads, burned scales pattered to the floor like rain, sloughing off as new ones sprouted beneath them. You're just weak. Before either of them could react, the head snapped forward, covering the distance between them in an instant and slamming into Kana like a battering ram. She crunched into the far wall and slid to the ground unmoving. Kana. Lucy dashed toward her friend, but a wall of scales slammed down between them. I don't think SSSO. The neck gave a jerk and sent Lucy spinning away across the stone floor until she rolled to a painful stop. She scrambled to her feet, only to see all five heads hovering over her, Fang's bed. Their ISSS nothing you can do to USSS. They hissed in chorus. If you were capable of fire, you would have asked it by now. Five tongues flicked in and out. Summon another spirit. Struggling will only make it more satisfying. Lucy shuffled backward, her mind whirling. He wasn't wrong. Even with all the power Flute's boost had given her, her spirits could only inflict physical damage. It was hopeless. She couldn't, her eyes fell on Kana, still motionless on the ground. But, so what if it was hopeless? Fighting Flute had been hopeless, and they'd beaten her. She was a fairy. That's what they did. She held up her hands, each clutching a key and glared at the takeover mage. Good. The snakes crooned. S show me what your final moments will look like. Lucy thrust out both keys and poured her magic into them. Open, gate of the lion and the ram. The sound of bells filled the air as Loke and Ares materialized. It was almost shocking how easy it was to call them. Both out. Perhaps it was just the adrenaline, but Lucy felt as though the feet had barely taxed her. She pointed at the Hydra. Show him just what fairy tale is made of. As you command, princess. Loke laughed, holding out a hand to Ares. Shall we? Smiling weakly, the ram spirit took his hand. Yes. Loke entwined his fingers with hers and spun her around in a pirouette before pulling her close. Together, the spirits pointed their hands at the mass of scales towering over them. Red yawned, five sets of jaws opening wide to swallow them whole. Celestial unison raid, golden peace. A cloud of golden fluff erupted from their hands and wafted towards Red. The takeover mage gave a chorus of snorts and a pair of heads snapped forward. Their fangs sunk into the shining wall and tore it in half. Almost instantly, the pair of heads biting the fluff went still, their eyelids drooping heavily before shutting. 
The scaly necks went limp and slumped to the floor and began to snore. The remaining heads jerked back, alarmed, as the shiny cloud of wool began to expand. Enveloping the mage. Red roared, his heads trying to jerk away from wool, but it was no use. Within seconds, he was completely covered. The cloud of fluff jerked around a few times as Red tried to break free. The struggles grew feebler and, in mere moments, stopped completely. The golden cloud dissipated, and the takeover mage slumped to the ground, shaking the floor as his head thudded into the rock. Well, that's that. Loke smiled, turning back to Lucy with one hand wrapped around Ari's waist. You're welcome, princess. It's, er, uh, been a long time since we've done something like that. Ari said, her face going red. It was, nice. Oh? Loke grinned. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Leo? Ari squeaked, hiding her face in her hands. Lucy ignored them, dashing around the slumbering monster and making a beeline for Kana. The card mage looked the worse for wear. What she could see of her friend's back was a giant black bruise streaked with blood. Lucy crouched beside her, putting her hands on the maid's shoulders and giving her a shake. Kana. Wake up. To her relief, her friend stirred, one eye cracking open to look at her. H. Hey, Lou, Kana croaked. Did we win? Yeah. Lucy answered, her eyes wet. Sweet. Kana's words were slurring, like they did when she'd drunk a full barrel of booze. Knew you could, do it. Her eye closed. Kana. Lucy yelped. Her head whipped around when she felt a hand on her shoulder. She's just unconscious, Lucy. Loke said gently. Kana's tough, she'll pull through. He turned his head, Ari's. Right? The ram spirit thrust out her hands, and a pink cloud of wool materialized underneath the card mage, gently hoisting her off the ground. Kana groaned and sunk into it with an unconscious sigh of bliss. That will help her recover. Ari said. I if you want, I can get H her out of here. Take her somewhere safe. Lucy bit her lip, looking back and forth between her friend and the chamber Red had emerged from. She wanted to stay with Kana, but they had a mission to complete. Goku had freed her from flute. That was a debt that couldn't possibly ever be repaid. She nodded. Thank you, Ares. Get her out of here, keep her safe. She turned to Loke. You come with me. We're not done here. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
They grew and widened, twisting to the size of a small catwalk before they began to grow outwards. The vines reached around the entire room, each and every one of them passing near one of the holes where the blobs of goo were fired from. While Droy exerted his magic around the room, Lever's pen was scribbling at supersonic speeds, pumping out little squares of magic with two words written on them. On one side, stick, and on the other, backlash. As the two worked, Jet began to stretch, watching the paths that the vines formed intently. This is a big room. Droy said as sweat began to trickle down his face. I'm probably not going to be able to keep the whole thing up for longer than 30 seconds or so. Plenty of time. Jet shrugged off the concern. Ready to go, Levi. 344, 345, 346, 347. Ready? Path ready, Droy. Just about. On your mark. Jet quickly grabbed each and every one of the hundreds of squares, shoving them into every pocket he could on his pants and jacket. The rest he kept in his hands, ready. Get set. Jet sunk down into a sprinter's starting position, his focus entirely on the vines. Go. Jet disappeared in a blur, and the two mags were treated with the sight of an orange streak bouncing around the room off the vines. Occasionally, they were able to spot as he slammed on of the many squares home, sealing up another one of the firing points. Right as Droy felt his magic begin to slip and the vine started to weaken, Jet slid to a stop in front of them with a bow. The room is clear, my dear lady and good sir. Nice job boys, less than three minutes from start to finish. Levi beamed as she walked through the miniature jungle to Urza. Her pen was back in her hand and the words DIY and recede were both glowing beside her. With a quick wave the pair slammed into the Urza statue and the black goo shriveled back up into the tiny black balls that it had spread from. The now useless beads fell harmlessly to ground and Urza fell to her knees, gasping for breath. Jet and Droy immediately turned their back when they noticed her state of dress and prayed that she was too distracted to really notice that they had seen anything. You good to go, Urza? Levi asked. We need to get moving, we have no idea what's happening in the rest of this place and Urza's eyes snapped open, revealing emerald green iris that burned with fury. Urza. The red head climbed back to her feet, summoned her giant armor, and ran straight through the closed doors on the far side of the room with an enraged shriek. Levi stared after her for a moment before turning around, grabbing both the boys and backtracking towards another one of the paths that Wendy had pointed out to her. Following Urza like that just seemed unhealthy. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
I know that I am asking a steep cost from you, but the benefits will far outweigh them. Altia sighed. I understand that this likely doesn't bring comfort to you now, but it will all be over soon. Soon, it will all be better. Goku shook his head. It won't be me though. None of those people, they won't be us. Everything we've done, every challenge we've overcome will be meaningless. Who we are will cease to exist. Goku rose to his feet and stared Altia in the eye. I can't let you do this. I won't let you take my energy. Goku rose to his feet and clenched his fists tight. Hardened eyes met dispassionate ones, and Altia's voice sank back to its monotone. You can't stop me. Sure, I can. I just need to be willing to give more for my beliefs than you will for yours. You are willing to risk absolutely everything to make the world the way you want it to be, everything except for your own life. Altia's eyes narrowed. You think I haven't put my life on the line for this, she scoffed. Try serving under Master Hades for a week and see how safe that is. I've seen more of people put to death these last few years than you would ever believe. If Hades or any of the others had ever had so much as a suspicion as to what I am going to accomplish here today, they would have killed me on the spot. My life has been on the line since the moment I chose this path. I'd die to bring about this future if it meant success, but this will only work if I continue to live. Do you hear me? I'd die for the new timeline. And I'd die for this one. Goku snapped. This is my timeline, with my friends and family. It's not perfect, but I'm not going to let you destroy it. Kaioken. Red erupted around Goku's body. Altia shook her head. You can't use that technique to boost yourself to the same level as your monster form. That isn't anywhere near enough. I don't need to power up to break out of here. All I have to do is power up enough that I blow up my heart. Altia's eyes widen just a fraction. What? The Kaioken strains my body the more I use it, and the higher I push it. Your runes can heal my injuries, but can they resurrect the dead? No, no. Altia stepped forward, panic in her eyes. Stop this. You can't. You said it yourself, there is no way in or out of here. You can't stop me. Times two. The aura around Goku flared again, and Altia could do nothing but slam her fists helplessly against the window. Don't do this. I've worked too hard, too many people have lost their lives for this you can't just throw it all away now. Time 3. The muscles on Goku's body bulged, and Altia realized with growing horror that there was nothing that she could do to stop it. Her plans, everything that she had worked for. Her life's work. No, mother, I'm so sorry. K-A-I-O Ken, time, for dash. Enough. A new voice roared through the room. Goku's aura vanished in surprise, and Altia whirled around to find a sword pressed against her throat. Urza Scarlet stood behind her, her eyes glowing green and a snarl on her face. Don't even think about it, Goku. She hissed. I am going to have a very brief conversation with this woman, and then you and I are going home. Kill yourself, and when I bring you back I will make you regret it for the rest of your days. Chapter 54 Times turn part four. Sounds of silence. xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
tentatively poked a finger into Myra's exposed belly, turning her gaze on the mage's face to see if there was any reaction. It was like poking a rock, Myra's skin refusing to budge under Levi's finger, and the word mage's eyes narrowed. She's stiff. You mean stiff like? Jet swallowed, a corpse. Levi shook her head. More like she's paralyzed. She gave swords a suspicious glance, and Jet caught her look. If we pull the swords out, will that fix her? Jet asked, stretching out a hand for one of the glowing hilts. Don't touch them. Levi yelped, grabbing his hand. She gave him a look, come on, Jet, what's the first rule of Team Shadow Gear? When in doubt, don't touch anything. Jet answered automatically, looking sheepish. Sorry, Levi. But still, think if we remove those swords she'll be all right. That does seem likely, but... Levi frowned at the blades. She could think of several types of magic that could leave someone so helpless, but they tended to revolve around actual petrification, and Myra's body was clearly still flesh. The swords had to be something else. Levi raised her phoenix quill and slashed it through the air, running through several identifying spells. In moments, she had her answer. Divine magic, she breathed, swallowing hard. She'd read about this kind of magic. Divine fire and holy light that stood opposite the black fire and brimstone of demonic magic. It was believed to be the weapon of true saints and holy beings. This was the kind of holiness that declared justice and peace could only be had when all its enemies were ashes. It wasn't a very friendly magic and could often rival or even surpass demonic magic in terms of nastiness. They probably would have seared Jet's hand off if he touched them. Levi raised her quill again and wrote out dispel. The word floated toward one of the blades and settled against it. There was a flash of light, and Levi's spell burned away. Levi frowned, and jotted out a few more words, weaken, gutter, desist. Each word burned away just the same, leaving the sword burning bright as ever. Levi sucked in her breath. Okay, so tampering with the swords was a no-go. That left one option. The word mage placed her quill against the Myra's flesh and thought for a few moments and began to write. Forgiveness. Absolution. Sanctify. The swords flashed angrily, and her words started to disintegrate. Levi narrowed her eyes and wrote faster, pouring more of her magic into every letter. The underlying principle of divine magic was that was meant to punish the wicked. Myra used demon magic, but that didn't mean she was one. She conquered demons and took their magic, turning it to help those who needed it. She did not deserve to be punished for it, Levi just had to make the blades understand. Levi began to sweat with the effort of the writing, each letter taking more out of her, as the swords blazed resentfully against her efforts. But she also could see the them starting to flicker, as though her words were making them doubt their own righteousness. Pouring every last bit of magic into a final word, Levi's cool flashed through the air. Mercy. The word shined on Myra's skin like moonlight, and, with one final flash, the swords winked out of existence. Myra went limp, her body slumping to the floor and shuddering as her lungs drew in a shuddering breath. The mage took a few more breaths before turning her face toward Levi. Thank you. The words were quiet, and Levi could see tears running down the woman's face. The word mage felt a stab of outrage, but did her best to keep her voice level. Myra, can you stand? Myra lay still for a moment, before nodding. She tried to push herself upright, but her arms were shaking, and they slid out from under her. Jet and Droy stepped forward, sliding their arms under her shoulders and lifting the takeover mage to her feet. Levi swallowed. They couldn't bring Myra with them. Not like this. Droy, can you get her out of here? Droy nodded, pulling more of the takeover mage's weight onto him. Sure thing. Do it. Levi turned. Jet, you stick with me. If they brought down Myra and Urza, 
the others are probably in trouble too. We need to find them. Jet nodded, stepping crouching and turning so Levi could climb on his back. Once he had a hold of her, he took off back down the tunnel, searching for friends in need. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
causing more glowing green runes to burst into life around the walls. That field will destroy any non-animal organic matter that attempts to enter the room, she said. Just in case you wanted to start summoning plants to attack me. Calm and disinterested, treat her like she isn't a threat. Keep her confused, keep her off balance, keep her angry. Don't let he hit you, whatever happens. Urza threw a punch of her own, the gauntleted fist of the giant's armor promising to cave her skull in, but the blow was sloppy, Goku would have wept to see it. Altia threw herself out of the way, reaching out a hand to brush against the yellow metal. Rust immediately stretched out across the entire surface, as the giant armor joined the sword as a pile of dust on the floor. Requip. A flash of light and Urza was wreathed in silver armor, with dozens of swords rotating around her form. Heaven's wheel again. That didn't work very well the last time you put it on, are you sure? Altia asked flatly. Urza flicked her wrists and the swords left orbit around her, and instead surrounded Altia. Over a hundred weapons circled her, with every last point aimed straight for her heart. Ah! I can see that this time it is being put to better use. This battle is over. You can't hope to rust them all before they skewer you. Urza said, moving to walk around the rotating circle of weapons towards Goku's window. Twitch a single muscle, and I'll turn you into a pin cushion. Really? How many times has someone said something like that to you throughout your life? Has it ever once been true? Would you rather I just kill you then? I'd rather you don't underestimate me. My powers don't require physical touch you see. It's merely more directed. Altia threw her arms to the side, unleashing a bubble of yellow energy out of her body that flew outwards and consumed Urza's blades. The red head immediately scrambled away to preserve her armor and took to the air. Altia watched her carefully, but when it was apparent that the red head wasn't going to try and charge in, she allowed her barrier to drop. Urza was hanging back now, and the way her eyes were scanning the room said that she was trying to work out some kind of strategy. Giving her time to actually work something out seemed suboptimal, so. Do you really think you have time to just float there watching me? You do realize that you are on the clock, yes. Altia watched in satisfaction as Urza's eyes hardened and waited for the next attack. Instead of charging though, Urza landed a short distance away and allowed her armor to fade away, donning her ruined clothing instead. You're right, I'm on the clock. Holding back will get me nowhere. Rearing back, Urza slammed her fist into the ground, and a giant wall of stone rose up to surround her. Slowly, the stone turned cherry red and began to compress down around her. Then, pieces of the stone were blown off, as beams of glowing rainbow light exploded off of her, and then began to wrap themselves around the red-hot rock. A pair of dragonfly wings burst free from the back as the rock finished compressing, revealing an entirely different warrior. Titania Mode, Diamond Queen Suit Urza's quiet declaration seemed to vibrate the very air in the room. Ah! That's less than fortunate. Altia began slowly backing away. Urza took a single step forward, and the time mage immediately brought up her hand, unleashing her time magic to its fullest on the phase armor. What's that expression? Diamonds are forever. The utter confidence in Urza's voice set the hair on Altia's neck on end. Despite her investigations, there was next to no credible information available on the fae, and nothing she found would allow her to win the fight. Still, she was not without options. In humanity's frail sense of time. Perhaps. But in the end. She threw up her hands as Urza charged. Arc of time, flash forward. Urza roared, lunging forward with her sword held high. Altia didn't move, couldn't move. She was focusing everything on this technique. Dodging or reacting in any way would cancel her magic. She only had one shot. Urza's armor transformed from sparkling crystal to the dull gray of graphite, shattering with her movement and sending her sprawling. The woman immediately began forcing herself up, 
growling as the chunks of armor falling from her body left great gray streak on her skin. Alti grinned, a bead of sweat trickling down her brow. Everything kneels before time, Urza Scarlet. She put her hands behind her back and smiled. Is there anything else you'd like to try? Urza glared at her, eyes blazing as she stepped forward, then paused. A thoughtful expression crossed her face. And yet, you still can't use your magic on a person. She said slowly. Otherwise, I'd already be dust. Oh dear. Reducing the pride of your harmony to such a state isn't enough. Altia's grin stretched a little wider, perhaps desperately wide. What else can you hope to challenge me with? Urza stared at her for a moment, then shook her head, sighing as she straightened herself. I am ashamed that it took me this long to determine the weakness of your technique. Nastu would have beaten you much faster. Urza let out a long-suffering sigh before she gathered up her equip magic once more. Breast bindings, red pants decorated with flames, and a tie for a ponytail flared up into existence around her body, without a single weapon in sight. Now, the worst that you could do to me is simply leave me naked. Urza said with a crack of her knuckles. Absolutely nothing compared to what I can do to you with my bare hands. That was not incorrect. Altia flung her hands up calling forth her magic, calling down crystal orbs to try and brain the warrior where she stood. Her magic aged the knight's clothes to dust. Urza was unperturbed, batting away the weapon with contemptuous ease. Then her wings began to buzz and she vanished. The next thing Altia knew, a fist was planted firmly in her stomach. Altia's eye went wide as spots swam before them. She felt a second blow, and then everything went dark. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
Could she exploit that, distract them? You were about to smash her head open with your bare fists when I showed up, Urza. After what happened the last time you turned your pixie powers on, I thought maybe it might be a good idea to stop you before you had the chance to land the killing blow. You're not going to want to have killed her when you snap back out of it. My powers have nothing to do with this. It has to do with the fact that our friend is still standing behind us, silenced and caged up to be used as a battery when we cannot do anything to release him. Fay powers or no, I am more than capable of killing someone if I believe that they are threatening the lives of my friends. Look around you. This entire complex was designed to trap us and brutalize us in the event that we took issue with the fact that she was trying to kill our comrade. Urza gestured angrily to the screens on the wall. She was sitting here watching us. Look at what she has done to Myra. We do not even know if Wendy will be able to save Juvia. And we can't figure out where Gajil's room is. I cannot and will not forgive someone like her. You don't need to forgive her. Hell, I'm not even saying not to kill someone trying to kill you. I'm pretty sure that I just killed that wind guy a couple of minutes ago. But there's a big difference between killing someone in a fight and executing someone who can't fight back anymore. She was out cold. Altia scoffed, unable to help herself. To hear you lecture about restraint after what you've done, I don't know whether to laugh or be horrified. The hell is that supposed to mean? It means that I doubt anything resembling those ideals of yours were bouncing around in your skull when you brought about the death of my mother. Gray's mouth, open to fire off a retort, snapped shut as he finally noticed the woman's features. With no small satisfaction, Altia watched as his face turned ashen. In the background, Lucy yanked Natsu back to keep him from interjecting his own opinions on the matter, while Urza stood passively, her arms folded and eyes narrow. You, you. Altia Milkovich, at your service. By your expression, I can assume my mother you at least spoke of me to you at some point in time. You? He choked, flailing for words. You're said that you died. She was heartbroken. As was I when I found out about her death. I spent most of my life up until that point trapped by a group of dark mags to be used for experiments and when I get free what do I find, she sneered. I find that a little boy's rage-induced lust for revenge had put her in the path of something she could not hope to defeat. Then, you ran off to find a new family, while I was left without so much as a body to bury. It's funny to think about actually. We might have grown up as sibling had our situation been different. As things stand now though, you are one of the primary reasons that I was orphaned and set myself upon this path. I, I never wanted to hurt you. That day, I went there to die trying to kill that demon. I knew I probably wouldn't succeed, but I couldn't live with myself without making some sort of attempt. You couldn't live with another kid she cared about dying, so she took my place instead. That's why I've been trying to live my life how I think she'd want ever since that day. You've got to know that she would never want anything like this. Your friend in the cage already tried to talk me off my path, Altia answered, uninterested. And he did a far better job of it too, despite his more, limited vocabulary. I'm set on this path, and I'll keep trying until the day that I die. I will get my mother back, no matter what. Every person in this room has lost parents or guardians in some tragic fashion in their lifetime. Urza said, looking down her nose at the prone time mage. But none of us use that pain as an excuse to cause suffering to others. You will never get another opportunity to try, and you'll never walk free again. You can't wield your magic, and even if we cannot free Goku now, you aren't capable of doing anything to him either. Your plans have failed. It's true, now that you have an understanding of the limits of my time magic, I can't hope to beat you with it. Your choice of bindings leaves my power worthless. However, Altia's eyes narrowed. I am not just the result of those experiments forced upon me. The temperature in the room suddenly plummeted below zero. 
The hair bindings turned to fragile frost, and with a simple tug of her arms Altia stood free once more. Her next gesture reopened the window within the cage. I am my mother's daughter. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
as the seal tried to claim the last drop of power that it needed to unleash Altier's magic. B.A. Bump His K.I. reserves depleted, the runes reached for his life force itself. Goku couldn't break free, he couldn't resist. B.A. Bump he couldn't even focus his KI enough to kill himself before his powers were drained dry. As darkness creeped in on the edge of his vision and his heartbeat began to slow, Goku did the only thing that he knew how to do when facing his death. B.A. Bump He pushed deeper. He pushed into his very core, dredging up everything and anything that he could to draw out just a shade more power so that he could survive, and there was something there a pulsing core of fury that answered his call. B.A. Bump For an instant, just a single moment, the room flashed gold. B.A. Bump The drain slowed. B.A. Bump Stalled. B.A. Bump Stopped. B.A. Bump He, he survived. B.A. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
and past the little creek and over the hill. Altia took off running. Her little body started gasping for breath almost immediately. Had her body really been this weak once? This soft? It must have been, but all that knowledge did was force her to pump her legs faster. In no time at all, she came across the spot that had haunted her nightmares for most of her life. The top of the hill where she had laid down to see her mother teaching her students. The spot where she had become overwhelmed by jealousy and had ruined herself by turning around. When she reached the hill's peak, she blew past the spot without a second glance. They were exactly where she remembered them. The two boys were standing side by side bickering. You're just stood in front of them, giggling at her students as they squabbled. This time, Altia didn't break stride, the tears rolling down as she opened her mouth and called. Moom. You're whipped around and froze. The two boys instantly broke out of their argument and turned to see a small girl sprinting through the snow, barefoot and clothed in rags. Altia ignored them both completely. You broke out of her shock just in time for her daughter to tackle her to the ground, wrapping her arms around her and squeezing as though she would never let go. What how, Altia? Mom? Gray and Leon shuffled awkwardly, glancing at each other as tears began pouring down their teacher's face. Altia. Altia, oh Altia. They told me that you died. I thought that you were gone. They wanted to study my core, they that I was special, and that you decided to give me away. They said you didn't want me. She knew it wasn't true now, she knew it was all a lie, but to just hear it from her mother's mouth. Never. I'd never, ever ever, abandon you like that Altia. I love you. Do you hear me? I love you so much. Altia's ribs started to ache from the force of her mother's hug. It was the single best feeling in her entire life. For just a moment, she forgot all of her plans. She forgot the tower that her mother would inevitably decide to track down and destroy, the demon that she would have to ensure that Grey never had a chance to pursue, and all of the people that she swore that she would try and help this second time through life. For just a moment, that all fell away. She was home. XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
when the spirit burst into existence next to Goku. Lucy! Urza shout. The blonde ignored her, waiting impatiently for Virgo to secure her passenger. The instant the spirit gave her a nod, Lucy sent them straight back to the spirit realm, and then aimed her key beside her one more time. Open, gate of the maiden, Virgo. Goku's body hit the ground, lifeless as a ragdoll. Princess, I'm afraid that he isn't breathing. I'm not sure if he is alive. Lucy didn't hesitate for a second. Throwing herself to the ground, she flipped Goku onto his back, straightened his neck and tilted his head back. Then she put her lips to his and breathed, watching his chest to make sure it rose. Once, twice. Then she pulled back, pressed her palms against his sternum and began to push. Up and down, over and over. Nastu. Urza. Find Levi, she called, counting to herself as she compressed Goku's chest. W-H what? Levi. She's somewhere around here, we saw her on the screens. She has that phoenix quill. W will that help him? Gray asked. Do we have an actual healer on hand? Lucy shrieked at him, still counting. Urza was already moving, one hand on Natsu's vest as she dragged him through the door. Lucy shot her mouth and focused on keeping the chest compression steady and even. She would not let Goku die. It was not an option. What can I do? Gray asked. Hold his head steady. She ordered, and get ready to switch with me if I get tired. Her mental count reached thirty and she moved over and leaned down to breath for him again. In her flight armor with Natsu's nose guiding her, and all the destructive force of her desperation ready to destroy any wall that got in her way, they managed to find Levi and get her to Goku within two minutes. Levi wasted only half a moment gawping at the sight of Goku before she threw herself beside him, cool raised. Urza said all his energy has been drained. Lucy nodded, not pausing in her chest compressions. Levi held the quill over his chest and spoke. Primal scripture, Kazing. The quill floated into the air and fire blazed around the letters, pouring off the quill and into Goku's chest. As the lights around the quill dimmed, Levi wrapped her hand around it and more fire poured off her skin, joining with the flames and renewing the stream of energy. This continued for several minutes until the quill began to dim once more. Sweat was beating off Levi's forehead as she gasped. I... I can't. I don't have enough magic. Urza's hand clamped around the feather, and the dying light blazed into a tiny sun. Magic pouring off them and into Goku's chest. After another minute, Goku's eyes snapped open and he gasped. Did, did we win? He murmured. Nobody knew how to answer him. Like and subscribe for more. Scribe for more.